everybody, welcome back to our Skeptics Welcome Small Group Bible Study. Uh, I hope you have been enjoying it so far. I think it's going to be a really a, a, a special series for us as Christ Fellowship as we really tackle all these topics the, that skeptical people have. I think it's important for us to know God's Word and be grounded in God's truth. Amen. But before we start, let me pray for us and ask for His blessing on our time together today. Let me pray for us. My Lord, thank you, Father, for giving us the privilege again to open your word and to study. And so, Father, as we tackle these hard topics, Lord, I pray that you would give us really the, the insight that only comes from your word through your spirit. And, Father, may we be more confident in your truth and be able to, uh, to, to give a better defense, Lord, of, of, of your beautiful gospel. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in the precious, of, uh, precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, folks, let me just start off by sharing this with you. You know, when, when uh, I first got married to Ashley, we were living back in Miami Springs, and it was a tiny home, and the backyard was just grass. There was really nothing there. And so uh, Camila, when Camila was born, we rarely went back out there because there was nothing to do. But once we moved down closer to the church, uh, the house that we moved into had a little pool in the back. And so when Camila got of age, uh, she wanted to start going into the pool and learning how to swim. Now, as, a fa as her father, I knew that I could spend all of my time uh, telling her about how great the pool is and how fun the, waters, the water is and all that good stuff. Or I could also warn her about the dangers of the pool. You know, you may not know this, but the leading cause of death between of, of one to three-year-olds is drowning. And so as a good father, I, had, I know I had two options. Either spend all of my time telling her how awesome and how fun the pool is, or warn her about the potential dangers of the pool, specifically drowning. And church, the, the, the answer was very obvious to me. You know, even though I want to talk about the pool, I spent a lot more time warning her about the danger of the pool rather than telling her about all the fun that she could have. Why? Because as a father, I wanted to warn her of this danger. You know, even though this danger, she couldn't really understand it. You know, she was two, three years old. She really couldn't understand the concept of drowning. I knew the concept of drowning. And so I was going to do everything in my power to warn her about the, 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 this, this real and present danger that maybe at this juncture she could not understand. And, and church, let me just bring that over to our time together in God's Word. Because just like I, a good father, I wanted to warn my little girl, right, of this danger that maybe she totally couldn't understand. is isn't just like that. And here's the main idea as we open up God's Word today for Bible study. You know, our Heavenly Father, He knows that there is a danger that we may not be aware of. A danger that, since we have never seen it or experienced it, we may tend to downplay it. And, and, and it's a danger that, get this, our Heavenly Father describes to us more than He describes heaven. Now, you may be wondering, well, Omar, what is this danger that our Heavenly Father, that God, that our Lord warns us even more than He talks about heaven. Well, folks, we're going to find out today from Mark chapter 9, all right? So if, you're, if you have your Bibles open at your Bible study, go ahead and open them to Mark chapter 9. And uh, today I have several thoughts for us about this warning that God gives us. And here's the first thing I want you to know. Write this down as point number one. Listen, Jesus, when He was here on earth, He warns us about the reality of a place called hell. Now, church, let's go to the passage in Mark chapter 9 and listen to what the Lord has to say to us. It says this. He says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eyes causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire 
is not quenched. Now pause right there and let's start dissecting this, this verse. Because notice that Jesus here warns us about this place called hell three times in this short little passage in just, in just these three verses. So I think it's important for us as the children of God, as a church, to talk about this concept of hell uh, because it's, it's a topic that I feel it's not talked, spoken in, enough at church. And honestly, there are many people out in this world that are really skeptical about this whole concept of hell. And so if the Lord took time, right, to talk about it, then I think it's, it's only reasonable that we should as well. Amen? So where did this term hell come from, right? Well, where does this come from? Well, the word hell in the original Greek text, you know, we always remind you the Bible was first written in Greek and Hebrew and then translated into different languages. Well, the word there for hell, whatever you see the word hell, in the original text is the word Gehenna. Gehenna. Now, the root word of this term Gehenna is actually the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom. See, in the south part of Jerusalem, there is a steep ravine that goes down into a valley. And in the Old Testament, long ago before this, this moment in, in, in history, uh, it was a place where evil kings of Israel, uh, specifically Ahaz and Manasseh, would actually kill, sacrifice children to this false god named Molech. I mean, at atrocious things. But then when a good king came around, whose name was Josiah, he actually got rid of all that stuff. And he made that area into Jerusalem's garbage dump. And there you would expect what a, what, what, what's in a garbage dump. There's rancid food, there's sewage, there's maggots, all, you know, all these different things. And what happened was that there was a fire consuming this garbage 24-7. So at all times, this fire was on because it was consuming all the waste from Jerusalem. And so as Jesus taught, right, like in this passage and in every other passage about this whole concept of hell, I'm sure he would often point, right, he would point down to this valley where they would visually see the fire, almost like a visual illustration of the reality of this place called hell, which is perhaps a reason that this Bible verse here, this, this passage, uses phrases like the unquenchable fire and where the worm does not die, right? It kind of has the imagery of what a garbage dump has. But folks, the reality is that throughout the Gospels, Jesus gives us many different descriptions of hell, many warnings of it. For example, he says that it's a place for the wicked. Uh, he says that there is a, it's a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, it's a, there's a place of unquenchable fire. We read it here. Uh, it's a place of, of no rest. So there will be never no rest in this place. And it's a place of outer darkness. And so it's very clear, you know, when you look at Scripture, that hell is a real place and that um, it is those who sin before a holy and righteous God who actually deserve the punishment for their sin in a real place called hell. Now, I know when we talk about this topic, it's just, it's just hard to talk about it, right? I mean, it's just, who, who wants to talk about this concept of, of hell? And I think what the reason is because hell almost seems inconceivable for so many people. It's, it's hard to wrap our minds around it, and so therefore many people reject it. Just to give you a few stats, uh, the Pew Research Center held this. They found out this. They found that 27%, get this, 27% of non-religious people uh, believe in hell. So people who have no religious affi affiliation of any kind, just regular people, oh, almost 75% almost of them do not believe in hell. Uh, for those of us, for those people who are, are people of faith, but they're non-Christian, right? So just either, any other religion, only 31% of people believe in hell, in hell. So almost 70% of people reject it. And get this, Christians, among Christians, people who profess faith in Christ and believe God's word, only 70% of people, of Christians, believe in hell. 30% of Christians say that there's no hell. Why? The reason I think it's because it's just so hard to understand, it's so hard to fathom that I think people reject it. And you know what? A lot of skeptical people, 
you know, skeptics welcome were in the series. They reject it as well. Why? It's just kind of hard to conceive. So, so let me just give us another angle that uh, at one point, uh, you know, several years back, I, I gave us this angle, but I want to refresh that memory in a week in service. Uh, so, so here's a way for, for you to understand. First of all, um, write this down as letter A. Hell is a place where God's grace is absent. Okay. The word grace uh, means... Unmerited, unmerited favor. And it represents all the goodness of God, all the blessings of God, all the favor of God. Everything that we don't deserve from God, that's what grace is. And so, uh, for example, when you look at heaven, you see a place where there's riches, infinite riches of God's grace. In fact, in Revelation chapter 21, it says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. Death shall be no more. Neither there shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For, for the former things have passed away. And so what we see that in heaven, there's an infinite supply of, of grace because it, uh, there's infinite joy, infinite pleasure, infinite peace, infinite satisfaction, infinite everything. It's, it's, it's the fullness of God's grace. That when you look at earth, right, what we're living in now, what we see is common grace. And common grace is aspects of God's goodness and favor that we don't deserve, that every person experiences. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, our Lord said this. He said, For he, speaking of the Father, makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on, and, and on the unjust. So, for example, there could be a godly farmer and an ungodly farmer. And both of them get the same rain from heaven, right? That's rain is grace, is a blessing from God, right? So see, it's common. Everyone gets to experience that. Uh, an ungodly person and a godly person may go to the same beach and enjoy the same perfect, beautiful weather, whether godly or ungodly. Why? Because it's common grace. It's a, it's a certain amount of God's goodness that he's bestowed on every single human being, right? So we're experiencing not all of God's grace, but aspects, common grace, aspects of God's grace in our everyday life. But then when you get to the place called hell, which is the topic for today, the way I, 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 it helped, it kind of clicked for me, it's almost like the absence of grace. Uh, it, it, a good way of understanding is that, is that there's absence in hell of any of the goodness of God, of the blessings of God, of the favor of God. Uh, and, and so we see that in hell, there's no comfort, there's no relief, no goodness, no laughter, no joy. Why? Because all those things come because of God's grace. And so a way of understanding, right, if heaven has infinite riches of grace, if earth has common grace, certain aspects of grace, and hell is a place that there's complete absence of hell, right? Common grace, absence and on earth, absence of grace here uh, on this place called hell. So the question is, what would cause someone to spend eternity in a place absence of the goodness of grace, uh, of, of, the, of the goodness of God? Well, write this down, letter B. Hell is a place for those who choose anything over God. Now, keep in mind that this place called hell is a place that was not originally created for human beings. In fact, at the final judgment, it says that Jesus will say, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So what we see is that in eternity past, when Satan rebelled against God, and certain angels followed Satan's um, um, following, God sent them to a place far away from called hell to be separated from his presence. However, the same applies to those people who just like Satan and those angels exchanged God for other, th for, for other things. In fact, we learned this last week in Romans chapter 1. Listen again to what it says. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So notice, the horror of sin is that finite created human beings exchange 
the glory of God, the worship of God, to worship and find joy and satisfaction in things other than God. See, they exchange God for other things. And so as a reminder from last week, you know, people don't go to hell because they reject the gospel. No, they, people go to hell because in their hearts they've exchanged the glory of God for created things. Now, to this, listen to how God, what God's word says when this exchange happens in the human heart. It says this in Jeremiah. It says, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. Notice, they have forsaken the fountains of living water, exchange God, and hewed out sisters for themselves, broken sisters that can hold no water. So, so it's very clear in Scripture that apart from God and apart from Jesus Christ, humanity is destined right, to spend eternity in hell because we've all sinned before God. We've all exchanged the glory of God. But only through Christ will, can one be saved. Now, if you're a skeptic, right, if you're trying to figure all this out and you're watching this right now, here's what I would just say. In logical terms, it kind of makes sense that if someone rejects God on this earth, what entitles them to spend eternity with God? If you rejected God on this life, then naturally what we deserve is that we spend eternity with God then for, without God for eternity, right? And so it doesn't make sense that someone rejects God now, yet spends eternity with Him, right? Just, just speaking in, in just plain logical uh, things. But here's the thing. When people um, talk about this, right, when we talk about this concept of, of, of hell, I think one thing that people get hung up is this, is this, is how could it be that someone who lived, who never put their faith in Christ, but lived a good moral life, so to speak, they didn't do anything crazy bad, you know, just lived a kind of normal life, yet they never came to put their faith in Christ. How can it be that they get the same punishment as someone who was uh, an enemy of the gospel, uh, did horrible things, uh, did atrocious, evil things? You know, how could it be that two same people, right, actually go to the same place and suffer the same thing? But here's what I want you to understand. Write this down as, big, uh, as point number two. And that is that God is perfectly just, okay, with those in hell and those in heaven. And so here's the first thing that I want to help us understand and just start to process. Write this down as letter A. And that is that there are different degrees of punishment in hell. Now, although the Bible does not specifically say, okay, I need you to understand this, does not specifically say that there are different levels of punishment in hell, it does seem to indicate that judgment will be experienced uh, differently for different people. So, for example, in Revelation chapter 21, and this is more like, an, you know, it's not a, such a clear, but it, it kind of gives a little bit of, um, of an allude. Which, by the way, if you hear some noise, uh, that's, remember, we're in a construction site, so bear with me, okay? Um, so, listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 20. It says, the people at the final judgment, are judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And so it seems, right, at this judgment, particular judgment, they are thrown into a lake of fire. That's, that's what God's word is warning us here. But it's interesting how the passage says that perhaps the purpose of this judgment is not only to sentence them, sentence them to an eternity without God in, in this place called hell, but also uh, to determine how severe the punishment is, right? It's, so it's an implicit, it's, you know, we're making assumptions here. But I think a clear passage is in, found in Luke chapter 10, uh, where Jesus actually speaks of comparative judgment. In fact, listen to what Jesus says, you know, he's speaking to, to, to the people, and listen to what he says about a village that rejected the gospel outright. They didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. He says this, I tell you, is in Luke chapter 10, verse 12. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day, on the day of judgment, for Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, than for that town. So notice, there's a comparative, there's different degrees here. And then he speaks to Bethsaida and Chorus and other little villages around the Sea of Galilee. 
And he says, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. See, Jesus, you know, so, so which Bethsaida and Chorazin had rejected Jesus. And so here's what we learn from this uh, discourse that Jesus gave. Is that whatever the punishment in, in hell, right, of the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah, those people who did unspeakable things, right, uh, Tyre and Sidon, other areas right there in, in, in northern Israel, that they were going to experience in hell, um, the Galilean towns that rejected Jesus, refused to hear him, were actually going to experience more, is what Jesus is saying here. And so it seems that the level of punishment in hell, right, it's, it seems to be correlated uh, to not only the evil deeds and the, and the things that they did on this earth, but also to the amount of light in the gospel that they rejected. Uh, so, so, for example, let's just go back to last week's Bible study, right? I think that the, 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 the example was the Pacific Islander. That was like the whole example, right? The Pacific Islander who never heard the gospel, who lived just a good, you know, like a regular life on that island, even though they sinned before God, it seems to, according to Jesus that they're not going to get the same punishment as, let's say, Hitler. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because Hitler killed millions of people. He was an evil man. And this man in the island didn't do much, right? Or someone who never heard the gospel uh, is going to get less um, punishment than someone who heard the gospel, rejected it, and even became an enemy of the gospel. You see what I'm saying? And so, 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 so again, listen, it's important to understand what determines whether we're going to be in heaven or hell is ultimately if we ever put our faith in Christ, right? We're all destined to hell because of our sin. Only through faith in Christ can we go to heaven. But it's interesting that even in the judgment, even for those of us, for those people who, who never put their faith in Christ and are spending, are spending eternity without the Lord, it's interesting that we have a perfectly just God. And, and I think we have to really embrace this because even in judgment— Okay? Even in judgment, the Lord is perfectly just. He's more just than you are. He's more just than I am. He's, all, he's more wise than you are and that I am, right? And so there has to be a moment where we trust that even though it's something that it's kind of hard for us to comprehend, even then, we need to trust the Lord before we fully understand. Does that make sense? So, so we, we need to come to a point where we trust in the perfect judgment of God. And we know that God is going to deal with every single person according to his perfect justice. And we just got to entrust ourselves to the Lord in that regard. But just like there's different levels, it seems, of punishment, right, in, in hell, right this down, letter B, there's also different degrees of rewards in heaven. In fact, listen to what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 6. It says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, and that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And in fact, throughout the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, there's many verses that talk about us being rewarded in heaven, which, 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 is, which is teaching us, and the, on the flip side of the other coin, right, is that when we as believers in Christ, when we serve the Lord, when we do things for the glory of God to further His kingdom, God is going to reward us. So for example, someone who, two people, right, who put their faith in Christ, they're both going to go to heaven, right? They put their faith in Christ, and, and, and the righteousness of Christ was imputed into them, and now they're able to stand before God with the forgiveness of sins because of their faith, right? So, so, so their faith in Christ entitles them to spend eternity with Christ. But here's what I, those two people maybe lived a different life. One Christian never did anything for the Lord. Like he was just, you know, he came to church. Uh, he never served. He never... Uh, uh, went above and beyond. He, you know, he never, did, you know, he never did outreaches. He never uh, served. He never did anything to help others. He was not generous, right? And then you have the other person who 
served as much as they could, sacrificed so many things, gave generously, uh, did stuff for the kingdom of God, lived for the glory of God, lived to further the kingdom of God. Listen, when we get to heaven, even though we're going to experience the amazing thing to be in the presence of God, God is promising that even then, God is going to be just. Just like those people in hell, He's going to be just with those in heaven. And He is going to reward each of us according to what we did and what we didn't do. In fact, this is why God's Word says in Hebrews chapter 6, For God is not unjust. For God is not unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for His name in serving the saints as you still do. So what do we, say? What do we see here? Listen, what are these rewards? I, I really don't know. There's hints of it, but we really don't know. But we know that it's going to be worth it to be able to, to see the Lord and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and be rewarded for everything we did for the gospel and for the kingdom of God. And so here's what I want you to understand. God is perfectly just for those in hell and in heaven. So before we break off into our Bible, into our small discussion, here's some things I want you to process, right? You know, talk about perhaps this view of how and how this teaching looking at, you know, has helped you better understand it. Maybe share your thoughts on that. Uh, share your thoughts about the fact that maybe a, 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 another point of conversation could be um, the fact that even in hell, God is just. God is not unjust, right? And in His perfect wisdom, uh, He is just and He, uh, there's different degrees, right, of, of punishment according to what people live here on this earth. Uh, and so talk about how we need to trust in the Lord, right, for, uh, in this regard. And then really, let's, I think it would be good for us to talk that just like there is a different variations of hell, there's, there are variations of heaven, of the rewards we will receive. And the question is, you know, what are you doing for the kingdom? If God has promised us to be just, then what are you in your, in your daily life, are you living for the rewards that Jesus is going to give us, Right. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you sacrificing? Are you, are you doing things for the kingdom of God? Or are you living really a self-centered Christian life? I think it's worth talking about that as well. So anyway, let me pray for us, and then you guys could discuss. Lord, thank you, Father, that you've given us your word. Thank you for the warnings that you've given us so that we, Father, we can have clarity on these hard issues. But, Father, when we are asked by skeptical people, we could be children that are grounded in truth, and be able to communicate, communicate things uh, clearly. And so, Father, bless our conversation now. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Bible study. Mm -hmm.